Uh, so we, we uh, welcome everybody uh, as we're going to go live now on Facebook as well. So I welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, I will first request uh, uh, Professor Razia Kurejo, who is the president of the Society of Obstetricians and Gyne Gynecologists of Pakistan, a dynamic president who has not uh, rested for a single day, I think, throughout this COVID epidemic, and not just been so active through uh, remotely through Zoom and uh, all these webinars, she has carried on. She's an inspiration for all of us. Professor Razia Kurejo, would you like to start? Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Sadia. Thank you so much. So now, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We are going to start with the name of the Allah and with the few verses of the Holy Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allah Allah Samad. Lam yalid, walam yulid, walam yakulahu kufan ahd. Sadak Allah Lazim. So, on behalf of Society of Obstetrician and Gynecologists of Pakistan, I welcome Professor Arun Kumar for being here today with us today. He is going to speak on a very important topic, migration from partograph to labor care guide. As all of we know that labor care guide is a next generation partograph which is based on the recent latest recommendation of the WHO on intrapartum care into practice. Its aim to is to improve the every woman's experience about childbirth and the uh, help the women of the for the well-being of the women and the their babies. So it is a as we all know in our developing countries, over one third of the maternal deaths and half of the stillbirths and quarter of the neonatal deaths occur as a result of the complications of the pregnancy and childbirth. And these deaths are preventable, knowing timely intervention, when to wait and when to take action. So I think this is very important for all of us. This labor care guide is a, I think, Old, this is the replacement of the old traditional WHO partogram. In this guide, we will learn how to monitor the labor, labor chart and fetal monitoring, maternal monitoring, and especially the respectful maternity care. It starts from the first stage of the active phase of the first stage to the end of the second stage of the labor. And also it is a very good tool for the healthcare providers to take the, assess the patient's condition, record their observation, monitor the progress of the labor, and for the taking the action plan. So I think it is very good for us, as Dr. Farooq has told, like the Dr. Arun Kumar is very, uh, he has spoken all this labor care guide in the Bangladesh Society. So now, thank you very much, for, Sadia, you have invited us on behalf of the society. So we are very thankful to Professor Arun Kumar for being here. He will guide us about how to implement on this as a society of obstetrician in Guyana College of Pakistan, how we will implement, how we will train, give the training to our uh, junior and senior staff, as Lubna is always working in this. So I am thankful to all of them, especially Professor Arun Kumar, who has given a time to uh, SOGP. And uh, I am thankful to past both are the past presidents, Dr. Farooq and Lubna Hassan. Both are very, they are old SOGP, so they know well SOGP than me. And especially, th I thank you both of them, and I thank you to Professor Sadia Sanpal, always with me, and organize this wonderful webinars. At the end, I am thankful to Sami Pharmaceutical Company, who have uh, always supporting the SOGP. So thank you, Sadia, now the you have to carry on. So I thank you. Thank you I am Professor very Rania. thankful to all of you. Now we will take how this labor labor care guide we will implement on the in our country in our setup on behalf of the society. Thank you, thank Sadia. You. Thank you, Professor Razia. So uh, I will quickly introduce 
although we, uh, we discussing earlier, Professor Arul Kumar needs no introduction. He is, uh, he is uh, a world renowned figure uh, in the, in the uh, sphere of uh, gynae orbs all over the world. Uh, Sir Arul Kumar has been knighted, so that's why I'm calling him Sir. Uh, apart from being a professor emeritus of obstetrics and gynecology, and an ex-professor and head of obstetrician, obstetrics and gynecology from 2001 to 2013 at St. George's University of London. He is the foundation professor of OBS and Gynae at St. George's Medical School, University of Nicosia from 2014, visiting professor of Institute of Global Health Policy, Imperial College London from 2012. He's the past president of the uh, FIGO, British Medical Association, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, he was appointed Knight Bachelor by Her Majesty the Queen of UK in uh, her birthday honours list in June 2009 in recognition of his services to medicine and health care, which are immense, as we all know. Uh, so he will be speaking to us uh, shortly. I will also int uh, introduce our eminent uh, uh, panelists and co-chairs of this session, our past presidents of uh, SOGP, Professor Farooq Zaman, who is principal and professor of obstetric, uh, obstetrics and gynecology at Rashid Latif Medical College, Lahore. He is a FRCOG, as well as all these additional FCPS degrees from Pakistan and Bangladesh, and he started his academic career at King Edward Medical College, Lahore, and retired as principal postgraduate medical institute, Lahore. He has also been the past president of SOGP, member of the Council of College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan, member of the team that helped produce the first IVF baby in Pakistan, uh, president Society of OBS and Gynae of Pakistan, uh, in, uh, and then also a South Asian Federation of OBS and Gynae, SAFOG, member of the executive board of FIGO 2006-9, and chair audit and finance committee of FIGO. Uh, as well. And uh, we have uh, Professor Lubna Hassan, who is also an ex-vice president of SAFOG, past president of SOGP, fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of UK, founder, director of YDI, uh, an NGO she founded herself, uh, CEO of the Women's Hospital in Peshawar, KP, ex-chairperson SAFOG Maternal and Neonatal Health Committee. So I will now request uh, Professor uh, Arul Kumar to start his presentation. So you can share your screen and uh, uh, we're ready for you. Uh, Professor Arul Kumar? Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, Arul, Arul. Oh, uh, we, we are joined by Professor, your friend, <laughs> Professor Rashid. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, welcome, Professor Rashid. If you can hear us, we can see you. Oh, thank and you. And hear you thank as you. well. Uh, it's always <laughs> honor and pleasure to yes. see the smiling face uh, or Sadia and the great... Sir, Sir. Dr. Rashid. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, it's wonderful. So, we were... Khan, yes, patron to us, always. Uh, he introduced me to Pakistan about three decades ago. So, I'm most grateful to you for doing that and for the warm friendship. Then I have uh, to thank Professor Razia Karejo, the president. Sadia Shan Paul for all the arrangements. And of course, I have to thank Farul Zaman and Lubna Hazan professors to share this session and to give me this opportunity to share some information about my talk. So the topic is about migration from partogram to labor care guide. And I will at the outset uh, declare my interest. I know conflicts of interest to declare. I've taken a lot of literature to 
produced this lecture and these are purely my thoughts based on published literature. But obviously I had correspondence with uh, Olufemi, who is called Femi in WHO, Metin, Mercedes from WHO and uh, Tina Lavender from University of Liverpool to put this uh, lecture together. So my objective of the talk will be to, why should we consider the issue of migration to labor care guide? Why can't we stick with the party ground? Why should we do that? Secondly, to understand the historical aspects of the party ground. What, how did we develop this WHO party ground? And where did we go wrong? Thirdly, to look at recent labor progress curves, so the recent research done by different people to see what might be the best way of identifying what's normal progress of labor. And finally, suggest the management of labor care guide in the future and draw some conclusions. So one of the main reasons we are looking at labor is because the cesarean section rates are going up. So this is a well publicized slide, as you can see in different countries, the cesarean sections are rising. And if you look at the world map, you can see for example, if you take Pakistan, the section rate is low, but if you take the capital cities of Pakistan, like Lahore or Karachi, then it might be high. So there is a, within the city, there is a regional variation, but because of the rural nature of many of the countries, the, the country statistics might show a lower cesarean section rate. It is also influenced by other factors. If you look at this, countries based on the Organization for Economic Cooperation. You see on the left of the scale, Turkey, which has about 53%, then Mexico, 48%, and so on. And on the right side, you find the Nordic countries, which has 15, 20% section rate. And the UK comes around about 26%. Now, this is based partly because there is more, the more care is given by private obstetricians, there's a high section rate because they can't be up the whole night. They don't need dependent care specialist or midwives to look after. Fear of litigation puts the section rate up. And thirdly, less counseling as to the risk of and benefits of cesarean section. Cesarean sections are lower where it is a national light cell system. There are organized guidelines and organized proper training and so forth. So we, we are caught in the middle and roughly globally if we take the average section rate is about 27%. So which is whether it is high or not is the question. So to look at the 27% section rate, is it acceptable even globally? WHO did some study and especially uh, Annabella Petron, uh, Annabella Petron did a number of studies on this and looked at what will be the optimal cesarean section rate to reduce the Maternal mortality, which is the left sign graph in per 100,000, and neonatal mortality, which is per thousand. And as you could see, the, when the sections are done, as we increase the section rate up to 10, 15%, the section rate uh, does not produce additional benefit for maternal mortality or neonatal mortality. So therefore, earlier the WHO took a stand, 15% might be approximately average and not 26% as we as I showed you earlier on. But there are limitations in WHO analysis. Correlation doesn't mean causation because in some countries, the area in which the population is living might be more urban with high section rate, whereas others might be more rural with lower section rate. And also the current data did not enable assessment of the benefit of higher cesarean section, which is more than 30%, because they stopped the analysis once they reached that horizontal plateau. So is mortality the only relevant outcome was the next question, because, well, we might be saving on the morbidity. Maybe there are less cases of uh, hypoxic ischemic uh, encephalopathy and pediatric outcome might be better, and there might be better psychological or social well-being for the mother, so we can't really take the maternal mortality or neonatal mortality as the key factors, but we had to look into the other factors as well. So when the WHO was challenged at this stage, then they come out with another statement in 2015, saying that they do not promote any specific rate to be achieved at population level, and they should provide cesarean section to all women who need, rather than trying to achieve a specific rate. 
but they recommended maybe each country, each region should use Robson's classification to look at their own cesarean section rate and seeing why the section rates are high, where can we reduce the cesarean section rate. So WHO came off that 15% standard section rate in 2015. Now, Robson's classification is a very straightforward one. It is not based on indication. It is based by fertility, onset of labor, gestational age, fetal presentation, and number of fetuses. So the straightforward parity, monoliparous or multipara onset with a spontaneous induced elective section, gestational age, whether it's over 37 or less than 37, fetal presentation, and number of fetuses. This is on a larger scale. And group one, two, and five are the predominant causes of the high section rate. Number one is nulliparous with single cephalic pregnancy over 37 weeks in spontaneous labor. So we are managing this spontaneous labor with partographs. So what are we going to, what are we doing wrong is the question. Number two, nulliparous with the induction of labor or elective section. So nulliparous contributes a lot. And the moment they contribute the section rate, they jump to number five because they are multiparous women with at least one previous cesarean scar because they don't get a trial of vaginal delivery. They are done as an elective section. So one, two, and five contributes a maximum cesarean section in any country compared to nulliparous with breach or multiple pregnancy. They are a small proportion. Now, we might say it is a very simple thing, but there was a recent study in 2019 done in Africa called the ASOS study, African Surgical Outcome Study. They did a seven day prospective analysis and found that the cesarean sections produce more maternal mortality. So this is the detail of the study. They studied 3,790 mothers in 22 African countries and uh, in 2016 and 17. The maternal mortality is 5.4 per thousand operations compared to 0.1 per thousand in the UK, for example. So it's 50 times higher. But we must remember that maybe the complications might be higher in these countries, like preeclampsia, ruptured uterus, bleeding, and so on. But sub analysis showed even intraoperative bleeding was a major factor, partly because the operators are not trained enough, and partly because there was no blood transfusion facilities available to give enough blood. So there are issues related to cesarean section in the middle and low income countries. So that brought to us the message that we shouldn't expose women to unjustifiable health risks because of the procreative oath is primum non, non serae, so we shouldn't do any harm and we should do on beneficence. So these studies generally kicked up a little bit of a uh, curiosity and even in the United States they started analyzing and they started with a slogan preventing the first cesarean delivery because that gives rise to the problem and if you look at the detailed analysis you can say the maximum cesarean section is at the time of uh, at the time of labor if you say in labor first stage arrest is 15 to 30 percent and second stage arrest is 10 to 25 percent failed induction is 10 a non-reassuring fetal heart rate 10. If you lump all them together, what happens in labor, that contributes to 50 to 80% of problems in labor, which give rise to cesarean section rate. So if you sub-analyze them according to Robson's classification, they fall into these three. That is nullipare over 37 weeks in spontaneous labor, nullipare with induced labor, or women who had one previous section. So these three groups, if you want to reduce that, we had to reduce the primary section rate. So we will go back in history to see why have we gone wrong? Well, we based our partograms on uh, the Friedman's graph or Friedman's labor analysis scientifically. Very few people read the original paper. They all thought, well, he has described normal labor. This is actually the original paper. As you could see here, in the Friedman's paper, 68 had forceps, one had section, one had trunk breach, four had pitus in 15 had augmentations. So by any length of imagination, this was not a normal labor, but people jumped onto the idea this must be the right thing to do. And the second thing we mistook was actually, the Friedman did not describe the slope of labor, minimum dilatation as one centimeter per hour. 
he said in his in his original paper, the maximum slope is 1.1 centimeter per hour. But somehow or other, it got mixed up, and he thought the women should not should dilate more than one centimeter per hour. So the slower dilatation might be even less, 0.3 or 0.4 centimeters per hour. So that was missed in the presentation. Now Phil Pot, who worked in Zimbabwe, got involved in photographic study. Mainly, he wanted to prevent women getting fistulae because of prolonged labor. So he decided to construct an alert line and an acceptable action line based on servimetric progress. So although when he studied this African primary gravid, they were dilating slowly, he says, we tried to establish the rates of cervical dilatation of a normal African primary gravid. So a similar pattern like Friedman can be described as a yardstick. This proved not to be the case. So the R labor curve was slower, but nevertheless, because they didn't have concluding studies, he took Friedman's curve as one centimeter per hour and constructed a graph at four hours to the right. So it is, his main aim was to separate efficiently the majority of normal patients from the abnormal patients so that they can be transferred in time. So he took one centimeter as the average or mean and took four hours to the right to intervene. But on the Western side, they took the other extreme. They said, if it is slower than one centimeter per hour, that's the maximum slow, if you remember, according to Friedman, if it is slower than that, they should have oxytocin. So as a result, Kirin O'Driscoll produces active management labor strategy and 55% of nullipare had oxytocin. So there was far in excess and that came as a standard and their partogram lasts only for 12 hours. So WHO took this on as a challenge because they didn't know which one to recommend, whether Phil Potts photograph or uh, uh, the Dublin photograph. So they convened a technical working group in 1987. And not only they wanted four chapters to be written about the management of labor, but they wanted to do a prospective wedge randomized study. And they selected Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And this is the... WHO paragraph, as you can see, the alert and action line, action line four hours to the right, the fetal parameters on the top and the maternal parameters in the lung. So they decided on the left of alert line, no action, right of the alert line, transfer to the peripheral unit. If it reaches the action line, review for augmentation. So you have to wait till it reaches the action line. The prolonged latent phase is just a review by medical staff and we established at eight hours. So the original paragraph from Phil Pot was taken as the basis. And the three of us, myself, Barbara Cost, who was the midwife who worked with Phil Pot, and Christopher Lennox from Papua New Guinea, we sat down for a week or two and produced this paragraph for the WHO. And we said eight hours is latent phase, alert line is one centimeter per hour, four hours to the right is action line, and we'll see what happens. So we decided on the principles, the active phase of labor commences at three centimeters. Latent phase should not be longer than eight hours. Active phase should be one centimeter per hour and lag time four hours to the right should be given. And the study was done in Indonesia. Then WHO appointed uh, their advisors to each other country. I looked after Indonesia at Budukamulian and Tangerang. Thailand was Ken Stewart and Malaysia was Christopher Lennox. And overall, by Barbara. And this was the publication. And as you could see, we clearly showed that the rate of augmentation can be reduced if you use a paragraph because otherwise they were using oxytocin just because their contractions were two or three in 10 minutes. The emergency section rate could be reduced. That was also shown. And also the stillbirth was marginally reduced. So these are the three factors we looked at the number of augmentation fell from 20 to 9%, emergency section 9 to 8%, and still birth 0.5 to 0.3. And these are 35,000 women who studied. Now the Cochrane doesn't include this study because it was a wedge randomized study and they thought it was not properly done. They wanted to go back on the results, but the results are not made available by the WHO. So that was the norm which was established by the WHO. But then because there were rising cesarean section rate, the alarm bell rang, people wanted to look at it. And Zhang in 2002 did a retrospective analysis 
of 1,329 nulliparous women. And he showed that compared to Friedman's curve, where the active phase starts at three centimeters, as you could see, according to him, the active phase starts around about five centimeters, then only it's one centimeter per hour. But the number studied were only 1,300. So he was very keen to study nulliparous and multiparous. So he produced this figure in 2010 with 62,000 women. So this is nulliparous women, this is multiparous women. And as you could see, only after five centimeters, there is almost a good dilatation of one centimeter per hour. Now, if you put it in numerical value, this is what you will see. The median dilatation, it takes 1.8 hours for three to four, but 95th centile, 95% of the women, if they are left alone, they might take even eight hours. Four to five, they'll take six hours. Five to six, they'll take three hours. But after five to six, they were dilating at one centimeter per hour or less than that. So if I was to construct a paragraph now, I will start the active phase only at five to six centimeters. And then I would put the action line three hours to the right. So that is what has been translated to the labor care guide. The, the American college immediately jumped the gun and they said after these studies from Zhang, said that they will extend the latent phase to 20 hours in nulliparous, 14 in multiparous, and six centimeters should be the start of the action line. And they should give at least six hours of oxytocin to see whether they would progress further. And we had originally done a study from Singapore in 1987, that if you are starting augmentation for failure to progress, you must give six to eight hours with good contraction to achieve the maximum vaginal delivery rate. So which is coinciding, this study was coinciding with the recommendation of the American college. Now WHO was not satisfied with that all because there was a lot of protest about uh, how do we respect mothers and so on. So they said they must do some original research about the progress of labor to bring the knowledge gap. They also should do systematic reviews of all the labor curves published to date they will do qualitative studies on what the woman wants and expectations of the mother during birth and the implementation tools. How would we revise the paragraph and how would we implement if we come with the labor care guide? So there are four components, research, knowledge gap synthesis and so forth. So I'm going to touch one example of research, knowledge gap and synthesis and so forth. So this is a bold project, which is actually better outcome in labor. And uh, this is a protocol which was published in 2015. And uh, this is how the labor curves will look like. Say this is 10,000 women from Nigeria and Uganda started in 2016. They let them progress in labor as the black lines appear. They did not intervene because the labor was slow by rupture in the membranes or giving oxytocin. And they managed to plot 10,000. These are nulliparous women, as you could see. And if you construct a line, the action line should start at five centimeters. Then after five centimeters, it is going at a straight line. So they decided they should convey that primary gravity we shouldn't intervene unless they are five centimeters dilated. Now this is multiparous women, again, from the bold study of 10,000 women. And the black line shows there are some of them who dilate and deliver as expected. There are some of them go for 10, 15, 18, 20 hours, so some of them. So you might wonder what happened to those who went into longer labor. Did they have a poor maternal or, or fetal outcome? The answer is no. So let us look at this dilatation pattern on the existing paragraph. This is the existing paragraph. And I'm going to extract the labor curve only to be shown, and then plot the labor progress of all these women, those who had good outcome, both maternal and fetal outcome. So as you could see, even if the woman delivered 15 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours after the labor started, they had good outcome. Now I'm going to plot uh, those who had poor outcome to see whether all those with poor outcome to the mother and baby, were they dilating very slowly or whether they are dilating very quickly or in between. So the red lines will appear in my next slide, which will show that there are equal number 
or more of poor outcome in the fetus and the mother, as you could see, the red line shows. So even if they had a shorter labor, they had poor outcome. So in other words, the cervical dilatation pattern did not predict the poor outcome in the mother or baby. So we are so obsessed all this time with the paragraph, we must not let them go into labor. Well, this has been coming on from previous, they say not to let the sun set twice on the laboring woman. So that's the same similar principle because they are worried about fistula. So this particular study, the bold study was published in the British Journal uh, and it says the conclusion, our findings suggest that the labor curve is very variable and assessment of a dilatation over time is a poor predictor of severe adverse outcome. So the validity of a paragraph alert line based on one centimeter per hour should be reevaluated. So that was the conclusion of the bold study. Now, if you put that all that graphs into numerical values, I'm taking nulliparous women here. If you watch this carefully, from two to three centimeters, on an average, the median, they took eight hours to dilate. Three to four centimeters, they took two to three hours. Four to five, just over an hour. Five to six only, they start at one centimeter. So in other words, action line should start at five centimeter. This is based on the, not only the Bull study by Oladapo, but also the Zhang's analysis, Suzuki's sheet. So this is a systematic review of existing paragraph, which all suggest that five centimeters should be taken because after that, they tend to dilate at one centimeter per hour or less. So that is very conclusive, not only from the bold study of 10,000 women, but also from the systematic review of all the paragraphs available. Now, multigravity is the same story that three to four centimeters, they take about three hours, four to five, just over an hour, after five, one centimeter or less. So in other words, one hour or less to dilate. So in other words, we can, for nulliparae and multiparae, we can conclude that in future, the action line should be at five centimeters and not lower than that. And we shouldn't intervene because we might run into problem. And just because the labor is going to be long, even in the active phase, it is not going to cause poor outcome to the mother or baby, provided we support them with hydration, nutrition, monitor the mother, monitor the baby. It's not going to go wrong. Now, I mentioned WHO wanted to do a qualitative study. And what did the woman want? They wanted a normal birth without intervention. That was number one. Number two, they wanted a healthy mother and baby. Number three, support from a birth companion, because that is known from the Cochrane data analysis itself that it gives a better outcome. Decide to be in control. So they will say, should I labor for another three hours? That decision should be made to the mother, given to the mother and not forced on them provided the mother and babies uh, in good health. And finally, sensitive, caring, kind, respectful staff. So how do we put this qualitative feeling of the mother and what they want with the scientific labor graph, the paragraph for progress labor studies together? So they came out with five elements. Respectful care is number one, how to support, how to give support to the mother, communication, and how do we communicate about what is happening? So you need more staff to do that. Labor companion, labor companion doesn't mean the husband or the mother or sister standing by. They must do some, perform some duties. And number one is he or she should be advocate of the patient, should be the advocate of the patient. So if the mother is saying, I'm feeling hungry, if I'm feeling um, thirsty, they should be able to get them the food and the, and the water and so on rub their back, reassure them, call the attendant, the midwife or the doctor if the review has not been done for some time or if she bleeds or something. So the labor companion has some tasks to do, not just standing there, and they should be educated before the mother goes into labor. Essential physical resources, including the facilities for toiletry and so on, should be because it was known the poor outcome, especially with group-based streptococcus sepsis was due to poor hygiene and to avoid overcrowding, how can we manage and so forth. So this was all put together. So we look at what does Cochrane say about all this. So Cochrane analysis was published by Tina Lavanda in 2018. So this is interesting. They looked at existing studies. They found 11 studies, three compared paragraph with no cartograph and eight compared different designs of paragraph. 
So in the three studies comparing partograph with no partograph, there was no evidence that standard use of partograph was favorable to no partograph. So it blows out everything saying whether you use the partograph or not, it doesn't make any difference. Exploring different partograph designs failed to provide any particular evidence of advantage. And perhaps the most convincing study was which compared one with and without latent phase on the chart. And that with, without the latent phase had less augmentation. So this study demonstrated that cesarean section and augmentation rates were higher when partograph, which included latent phase. So WHO pulled latent phase out. So in other words, Cochrane in 2018 also came to the conclusion that they are not sure whether using a partograph helps. We should do, so. that means we should do something different. So all these evidence I have suggested, plus the Cochrane suggests we have moved from one to the other. So should we move to Zhang's partograph then? Well, Zhang also combined with the Norwegian physicians and obstetricians did a randomized control study, which was published in the Lancet in 2019. And this is their conclusion. We did not find any significant difference in the frequency of intrapartum cesarean section between obstetric units adhering to WHO paragraph or the Zhang's guideline. Overall, there was a decrease in section in both sides, both arms. This might be because they were observing the labor closely. So their conclusion was the partograph, whether it is Zhang or WHO, did not contribute significantly to any change. You can use either of those, but we have shown that partograph use or no partograph use on the Cochrane didn't show any change. So where do we stand? We are at a loss now. So that is why WHO decided to introduce interpartum care for positive childbirth experience. So this is the crucial, there are a number of, uh, pages on this uh, document, which you can say, Interpartum Care for Positive Childbirth Experience at WHO. But I just want to show only two things. Number one, definitions of the latent and active phase of labor. So they agreed that based on all the analysis they are made, five centimeters should be made for first and subsequent labor. And the active first stage is a period characterized by regular painful contraction substantial degree of cervical effacement and dilatation from five centimeter to fall dilatation. And duration of the first stage, again, they said, because there's a wide variation, you can give up to 12 hours in the first labor. So five centimeters to 10 centimeter, normally we would give five or six hours, but they said, no, give 12 hours based on the dilatation curves observed. And in a multiparous case, give up to 10 hours. So that is their recommendation from that curve. And what one should not do is to intervene because she's slowly dilating one centimeter per hour, less than one centimeter per hour, um, minimum cervical dilatation, one centimeter per hour throughout active phase is unrealistically fast. So in other words, they're emphasizing that we shouldn't really intervene, we should give more time. So not only not to intervene before five centimeters, but even later, to give six, seven, eight hours. So if she's five centimeters, give about eight hours, six centimeters, give about seven hours and so on. So much longer period. So this was combined to form the labor care guide in addition to all the other components from qualitative studies, which are respected labor and childbirth care, emotional support, effective communication, pain relief, regular labor monitoring, oral fluid and food intake, mobility in labor and birth, pre-established referral pain pathway, continuity of care and so on. So all this has to be combined in the labor care guide. So that is labor care guide. And I'm going to dissect that into small portion so that we understand what it is. The most important part in this labor care guide is to pick up if something is going to go wrong. So these are called the alert features, alert features for each of the parameters we are looking at. Whether it's a qualitative care or a quantitative care, what are the alert features? And the alert feature key is given at the bottom, but I'll just explain to you by taking panel by panel. So the first panel, section one has identification and admission. So you can have the name, parity, labor onset and so on. The second panel is about supportive care. That is very important. Supportive care has companion, pain relief, oral fluid, and posture. If the companion is 
N not available, then it becomes an alert. So you put N and put a circle around it or put it in red. If the companion is there, she is told what to do to act as an advocate, give her some fluids, give her some help with the posture and also reassurance and so forth. So the what are the alerts for these parameters is given at the bottom and we can have a look at it. The third is about care of the baby, the baseline fetal heart rate. So in the past, we just plotted the heart rate, but the alert feature is if it is more than 110 or more than, less than 110 or more than 160, it's an alert feature. And they also included that um, by auscultation, you can do late deceleration. So if it came out late, you put L there, every half an hour you are supposed to auscultate. If it is L, then it comes under red. Amniotic fluid, if it is thick meconium, three plus, it's an alert feature. Or blood stain, it's an alert feature. You will mark, if it is clear, you put C. There's no need to put a round or red. But if it is blood stain B, then you put a red or put a circle around to alert. Fetal position, OP or OT, because their labor is going to be longer, they might go into difficulties. So you put an alert, caput, three plus or molding, three plus, two plus not, but three plus, yes. Woman, pulse rate less than 60, it's dangerous, there might be something going wrong, or more than 120, it's an alert feature. So these numbers are plotted where they are circled around so that they know it's an alert feature. Systolic blood pressure less than 80 or more than 140, diastolic more than 90, and temperature less than 35 or 37, and urine, protein, acetone. So these alert features plotted in this graph, if it is diastolic pressure 80, you will put 80 here, 80 here, but there's no need to take any action. But if you have an alert feature, especially if you have two alert features, then a senior person should be called. And depending on how variable, so how varied it is, you have to call a senior person to come in. Now, in order to help the late deceleration to be detected, people are changing these Dopplers, which are digital display, which with one switch, you can put it into a graphic display and you can identify small late decelerations as well. So that's a possibility in the future. The section five is with contraction frequency. You will put number of contractions and the duration. So if it is three, four, five, then you can put it that's normal. If it is less than two, you will alert as less than two. And if the duration is more than 60, or if the frequency is more than five, then it's an alert feature. Similarly, cervical dilatation, this is the major variable from what we are so used to. So cervical dilatation plotting or changing is, starts at five. So this is not a graph, this is five centimeters. And to move to six centimeters, they are giving at least six hours. So if it is more than six hours, she has not moved, that is of a concern. Six centimeter, they give five hours, seven, three hours to move to the next segment and so on and so forth. So the, if you plot a labor curve here and it might go somewhat like that, that is not abnormal because not one centimeter, but you can give more time because it has been shown earlier that it doesn't matter. Descent, it doesn't matter because some mothers, especially multiparay, it can be station minus three and within a few push, it'll be plus one. So they decided not to put any alert parameters. Section six is about medication, especially oxytocin and any other medicine and IV fluids. And assessment of the mother and the baby has to be written and the plan and the shared decision-making with the mother or the partner should be there. And section eight is the birth outcome, which is actually about mode of birth blood loss, neonatal status, APGAR scores, and so on. And these are the alert parameters to remind everybody at the bottom, for example, uh, yes is why D is declined, U is unknown, and so on, protein, acetone, occiput transverse, posterior, they will put OP and so forth. Now this is all has been studied and published in an article in 2020, July, about the initial experience, the usability, acceptability and feasibility of the WHO organized labor care guide. But, and they have produced a manual, which is the WHO labor care guide users manual, which gives how to individually look at each parameter and plot it. The reason they have come out with this urgently is because of this reason. I will read it out. More than one third of maternal deaths, half stillbirths and quarter of neonatal deaths results from 
complication during labor and childbirth. The majority of these occur in low resource settings and largely preventable through timely intervention. Monitoring on labor and childbirth and early identification and treatment of complications are critical for preventing adverse birth outcomes. Improving the quality of care at the time of birth has been identified as the most impactful strategy for reducing stillbirths and maternal and new newborn deaths compared to antenatal and postnatal care strategies. So this is actually becomes quite an important area for us to grapple with in country-wise. So my conclusion is actually um, maybe in Pakistan, you should get together, get the labor care guide and uh, create some pilot studies to see how easily it can be applicable because if you have less staff and huge number of patients, it may not be possible. So you have to find the feasibility of using the labor care guide in your own settings. That must be the first thing. The second thing, Pakistan can lead the world by organizing randomized control trials of comparing labor care guide with WHO paragraph. The labor care guide, as I mentioned, has additional component about the qualitative aspect as well, about the companion, about giving fluids, about posture, about analgesics and so on. And I've given the website there at the bottom, but there's no need, you can just type WHO labor care guide in the Google and you'll get the document and you can pass the document around and maybe um, start uh, implementing it as a prospective and then try and do a randomized control study. Maybe one hospital uh, observing labor care guide, the other not using the original WHO photograph or in the same hospital, there are two labor wards, you can randomize them to do two different things. So I would stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Aral Kumar. And uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, a reminder that evidence-based practice can improve outcomes both for the mother and the baby. <laughs> so uh, I will um, uh, just to share with you that only last year before COVID started, we had an emergency obstetrics and newborn care course in Karachi in which uh, most of uh, this was organized by SOGP and we had senior professors uh, from all over Pakistan and we discussed the WHO partograph and the recent recommendations of WHO which you just shared and uh, the, the and the ACOG which is uh, recommending starting it at six centimeters and WHO at five centimeters. And we came to a consensus, this is professors from all over Pakistan, that five centimeters sounded really uh, most appropriate to us. And that is that was the starting point. And then COVID happened. So uh, I think your uh, suggestion that we do randomized control trials is an excellent one. So I will open the floor for Professor Farooq and Professor Lubna Hassan to give their comments and then uh, maybe we, we can uh, have some questions for you. Professor Farooq. First of all, um, uh, Professor Arun Kumaran, uh, excellent as always and uh, extremely lucid. Uh, you made uh, things, uh, they couldn't be made clearer than this. Uh, and you have put everything into perspective. The amazing thing which uh, has come out is that labor is such a common procedure or common occurrence and uh, day in day out this is the most common uh, happening in obstetrics and uh, Friedman well he published his study more than uh, almost 70 years ago and uh, we still are not sure uh, how labor progresses and how to manage that and how to whether to intervene or not to intervene. And uh, uh, this is quite amazing. Uh, but I think uh, there, there has been this uh, uh, paradigm shift in that instead of calling it a partogram, now we are calling it labor care guide. I think this is an important step which has happened over these uh, years uh, because partograms were uh, uh, still open to question. Uh, this uh, document or this 
one page incorporates uh, a kind of comprehensive labor care and uh, also uh, monitors the progress of labor, uh, incorporating the uh, current viewpoint about the uh, uh, rate of dilatation of the cervix as you showed in those uh, dynamic graphs in which uh, uh, the labors of priming gravida and uh, multigravida were shown separately. And then also uh, of those women in whom the outcome was uh, not uh, as expected or not as was expected or it, something went wrong with that. So therefore, I think that, uh, this is something which is practical and uh, uh, I must commend you for the practical suggestion that you made that it may not be sometimes possible in some areas or in those units where uh, uh, there's large influx of patients and uh, there may not be enough staff. Uh, still, I think that uh, initiating uh, uh, this, uh, this activity to monitor uh, labors, I think that it will go a long way in preventing uh, or in reducing maternal mortality and achieving that uh, target of uh, uh, achieve, uh, achievement of uh, minim minimizing maternal deaths and also improving perinatal outcome. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you profusely for uh, this uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Professor Lubna. Uh, thank you, Sadia. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, thank you, Arul. It's so wonderful always to see you and to hear you speak. Because when something comes out of the mouth of somebody as illustrious as you, automatically it makes our job much easier when we are trying to implement something. So thank you very much. In fact, today I was uh, in a training session. We are, we've started the Robson's training. Uh, with WHO and the government, uh, the health department. Uh, and we are uh, actually training senior clinicians throughout Pakistan uh, uh, since the last two years. Uh, so today I did one in Peshawar. And I was just so happy that a few hours later I was going to come and listen to this because all we've been listening to is the partogram, you know, discuss the active management of labor. And it is just so ironic that from the very same place, we now have the Robsons uh, uh, where we had the active management of labor. Like we just uh, have, we seem to have lost patients like what Dr. Farouk was saying, but we seem to have just lost patients with our patients. You know, we want labor to hurry up. The obstetrician gets distressed. The families get distressed. The woman gets distressed. They want to do it quickly, just like everything else. And that is a mindset uh, that we have to change. Today, we were talking about having the companion and there's always a negative to that. And all the senior clinicians in the public sector and even in their private hospitals, they said, no, but the mothers come and they interfere and say, the, uh, you know, she's in a lot of pain. Please hurry up and do a cesarean. We are willing to pay hurry up and do a cesarean. So, you know, it's going to take a lot of work to change that mindset. Uh, you know, this waiting for them to dilate, failure to progress in primaries uh, is one of the biggest indications and failure to progress because they start active labor, uh, you know, with the first pain or two centimeters. We were actually haggling to find a consensus on uh, the uh, definition of spontaneous labor. Every clinician had a different uh, definition. So, uh, but I think, so this, if it's come from the WHO and it has proponents like yourself, I think it will slow things down. It will make people, uh, you know, step back and watch because you'll be surprised in the public sector hospitals in Pakistan, our cesarean section rate, the range is between 15 and 48%. 48% in a public sector hospital and many of them in group one, hardly any in group two. They're not inducing, they're not doing elective because they say they come complicated in labor, but complicated and then we have to do sections. So we have our own dynamics and I think Robson will really help us study it. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to meet you and to listen to you. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Razia and Professor Rashid and uh, Dr. Azra, and I'm not sure if Dr. Shahida is there, but if any of you have any comments or questions, please go ahead. Um, Dr. Razia, your mic is mute. Uh, Dr. Razia, your mic is mute, so unmute your mic. Dabao, Razia. Okay. She's with us again. Uh, Dr. Rashid, Professor Rashid, would you like to speak uh, first, please? Uh, your mic is mute. You have to unmute your mic, sir. Achha. Sadia, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Hello? I can. yes uh, Dr. Razia, we can hear you now. Uh, okay, okay. 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 So, so first, thank you, Sadia. So first, so first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Arun Kumar, and congratulate him for very excellent nice presentation, a new labor care guide. I said it is a next generation partograph. So we have to implement in our setup. You know, the partograph, old partograph, WHO partograph, we did a lot of work on that. So now we add on behalf of SOGP, we have to work on this and we have to conduct the workshops to see how to implement this new labor care guide in our own setup. And to, as Rubna said, the Cesarean section rate is going on and on, high and high, even in public se sector hospitals. Because of the patients usually in the tertiary care hospitals, patients usually come in the emergency. So it is very difficult to use this lengthy partograph. So, okay, we will do try it on behalf of SOGP, you, me, and all these. We will do conduct the workshops as we did the workshops on emergency of obstetric care so we will do on this workshops and the new labor care guide and we will implement like to implement on this so thank you so much for organizing i will much thank you all of you to organizing this seminar webinar very important a topic new labor care guide so we will hope we will do something for the future mm -hmm. and for the best so we have our own idea sogp's own ideas to reduce the maternal and mortality morbidity and parent perinatal morbidity. So we are trying so much for the SOGP is doing all the workshops and this to, to improve the knowledge and the skills of the healthcare providers for the decades. As we all know that we are conducting so many things, so workshops on this to reduce the maternal mortality. But as we are doing something going, going, so inshallah we will uh, get the some uh, improvement. So this is very good. So I much thankful to Lubna uh, and Dr. Farouk for being here and their comments. And I am thankful to Professor Arun Kumar for being here, giving us spending, giving us a very good uh, knowledge and spending us his valuable time for us. So I am thank you for all of them. And especially thank you for you to organizing this. You are always helpful to SOGP, you are one of the SOGP. Mm -hmm. At the end, I am most thankful to Sami Pharmaceutical Company for organizing this seminar because they are, without their support, we can't arrange this. So I am thankful to all of these. All the boys are sitting here with me. They are doing a wonderful job. So thank you so much, Sami. And now thank you everyone. Thank and you. I hope everyone of our SOGP member and uh, all of the healthcare providers who are today with us, who had listened to this uh, Dr. Arun's presentation and talk will get benefit from this. So thank you thank so you. much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Razia. And I would really, uh, we are really honored that we have Professor Rashid Latif who has uh, joined us. Uh, uh, I mean, he and his, one of his best buddies presented today. <laughs> so uh, it's an old, uh, not old, young boys club uh, huh? of uh, doers of this, uh, you know, this region and uh, UK as well. So, uh, uh, sir, you know, I know you've devoted your whole life to this profession. Uh, would you like to say a few comments about uh, this? 
Thank you, Sadio. First of all, uh, I also join my colleagues in thanking uh, Sir Arul Kumarin for giving us this much time and his valuable time. He's a very busy man, but he spares his time always for us. And his contribution is immense in promoting Pakistan and Pakistan gynecologists. Perhaps amongst those who are online and listening, I am the oldest person. And uh, I remember when I was preparing for MRCOG, I read Munroker's operative obstetrics many times in which all destructive operations or procedures were de described. And, uh, that is history. When no more we would like to see those destructive operations or operative uh, history as Munroker described. But from those days to date, we have come a long way, long way in management of labor, but perhaps still there is so much more to learn. And because these days in our country, basically the, whether it is induction of labor or natural labor, it starts in the morning by the evening that everybody is fed up as it was Lubna said, that mother is impatient, so is obstetrician, so all the caring people. And that's how the civilian section rate goes up. With this labor care guide, we must thank those who have designed it. Arul is part of that. And he gets the special credit for that. That with this care guide, I'm sure there will be better care because this is a very comprehensive chart. It is not like partogram, which was missing so many important components of labor care. And they have introduced those. Um, um, mother's condition, and so is fetus. So is the progress, which has been rightly from one centimeter right from the beginning. It has taken from five centimeter, we calculate that. Because that first latent phase was the important phase which made us do unnecessary cesarean sections. So uh, thank you, Razia, that organizing workshops and Lubna for uh, organizing from Peshawar to uh, Karachi. If all of you get together and conduct various workshops, introduce patients, patients, patients in all sections. It's, in Pakistan, the companion is really working to push the labor. Companion is pushing the doctor and nurses, do something, do something, pain, pain, pain. So we, here, we have to train our companions as well. But all of us, if get together, I'm sure the optimum cesarean section rate, which perhaps we have not come up to, whether it is 15% or more or anything, and uh, we'll achieve that unnecessary cesarean sections will be avoided and we'll have happier patients and relatives. And of course, with that morbidity, mortality of all kinds will be reduced. Harul, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done for us. Okay. And it's always a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, I can't thank, I, I, I'm, my vocabulary is very limited. And so I can't find appropriate words to thank you. But I can tell you that only yesterday I was discussing with Farah that in our labor room, put this chart. If the chart is not complete, don't see the patient. Just pass by it and let the junior doctors or responsible persons complete the chart because we are not in the habit of documenting everything. So this chart demands documentation. So all of us, if we have this attitude, that chart must be complete. Only then you will see the patient. So it will force our juniors to do the needful, make full use of this labor care guide. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you, sir. Mashallah. And, uh, and Mashallah, uh, every time I look at you, you look younger. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir, Thank for, you, for, for being so patient. So, Professor Arul, I've been looking at the 
you know, at the question box as well. Uh, while you've been speaking, we have been, uh, we have an audience of, uh, you know, we had an audience of uh, nearly a hundred uh, gynecologists and we are live on Facebook as well on the SOGP page. And this is recorded and it will be on our SOGP page. So those of us who have missed it or want to hear you again can do that very easily. And I will request you to visit our page as well. Uh, if you're on Facebook. Uh, so uh, the thing is, you spoke so clearly that I think we've all understood, you made every point so clear that uh, there are very few questions, like, you know, most of them are just praising your lecture. They, you've driven the point home very well. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I know you have probably got another commitment uh, after this. Uh, you took your precious time out for us. But would you like to say something in the end before we conclude? Uh, thank you very much. If I can just answer a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, one, it says, um, does the same rule apply to extremes of age like teenage pregnancy? Well, there is no research done specifically for teenage pregnancy, so you have to really judge by on an individualistic basis. So when we recommend as care guidelines or labor care guide, it is to what we call it Mrs. Average, not for the extreme very young girl or very old person. So you have to use your judgment, but the general principles will apply. So you can use the same principle, but not to leave too long. The second is actually um, worried most of the obstetric practice has inclined towards private care and that's the top reason for increased cesarean section. Well, that is also one of the issues as Professor Rashid Latif Khan and Lubna has um, suggested that uh, they all urge everybody's in a hurry. So that is something uh, which I fully agree with Professor Rashid and Lubna that uh, patient education is one but also the mother's education or mother in education. So the companions who are going to stay there, they should attend some antenatal classes or something to explain what is their responsibility and not to hurry labor. How can we introduce a labor care guide in these setups? Uh, well, I think um, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Pakistan can distribute the labor care guide as published by WHO and then conduct workshops. And uh, by that, uh, you should be able to introduce it. Uh, yes. uh, education about changing. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I fully agree according to the question. How much time should be given to the latent phase? Then according to the new guidelines, if we consider the active phase, five centimeters. Yes, according to the, um, the, the WHO, there's no prescribed time, but the American guidelines, as I showed you, this says, or primary gravid up to 18 to 24 hours, up to 12 hours. So as long as they are not in distress, give them the maximum time, hydrate them, give them reassurance and you can wait. And that is something I mentioned, it will be good to do a prospective study to see how, how, much it takes, uh, how much it takes for some of the women to dilate. Uh, how can we exactly start? So there are some questions for the society uh, how they're all anxious to start it, but how do we do that? I need to ask you, uh, we quote and implement uh, in our MRCOG prep, we follow RCOG guidelines. Is it, if it changes this, their perspective? Well, the labor care guide was published only latter part of last year. So it's going to take some time. Although the labor care guide uh, preparation was going on, the Usability, usability paper was published only last year. So I think it's going to take time for the RCOG and other colleges to recommend. But as I showed you in one of the slides, the ACOG has uh, partly endorsed about the latent phase and the active phase. But I think we should not really think for ACOG or the RCOG to introduce. We should yeah. think the Obstetrics and Gynecological Society of Pakistan to introduce. So why can't we the, be the first? We, <laughs> you don't have to be uh, waiting till the RCOG or the ACOG does it. We should do the first because you are backed by a big body like the WHO. So I think I would encourage you to start the material of what the RCOG or the ACOG does. Thank you. That's all the questions. Uh, 
Sadia, that uh, in a brief in a nutshell. Yeah, I think you've answered them very, uh, very effectively. And uh, I really like your suggestion about printing the labor ward guide. And uh, we, we're going to have successive EMONC trainings uh, uh, in the next uh, month or so. And uh, we can easily do that. We can uh, have this printed and that one page partogram, the, the updated one, the WHO. And uh, uh, it it should be easily implementable. Uh, I really think so. It is the attitude and behavior of the patients as well as the doctors. That is the, that is the real problem, you know, and uh, uh, rather than the document itself. I think yeah, that is a huge task. One suggestion I might say is actually to, for the SOGP to communicate with CRO, the Southeast Asian region WHO office, Mm -hmm. because they, they will be able to help you in providing enough material and also support and so on. So I think they are very keen. Okay. Yeah, I think we are with EMRO. I'm sorry. Yeah, Sadi, we, are with, with EMRO yes, and we are with EMRO now, Pakistan. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry, we, sorry about that. <laughs> but we will but contact EMRO, we, yes. We can do it through EMRO. I've worked for them and I, I yes. think I can, we can do I something. Contact the EMRO Absolutely. and see how much they can support your and yeah. they to introduce the labor care guy. And the country office is very keen, actually. I think we, yeah. We, yeah. we can easily get them to collaborate with us. Yeah, no, that'll be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So that's our next step. And we will keep you in the loop. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. You come and do the launch. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if uh, any of the other panelists have anything to say, uh, but... Uh, we, we've done very good with time, actually. <laughs> We're only 10 minutes over time from what we planned. So um, uh, this is an important topic. If, if people have time, most welcome. Uh, I, I'm worried about Professor Arul Kumar, though, uh, you know, with his commitments. No, I'm OK. If people want to ask questions, then I'm happy to. OK. So. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, you know, yeah. a few, uh, uh, some years back, I came across the paperless partogram, which was like, you don't plot a partogram. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept. It came from Bangladesh. And uh, the fact that people hardly fill this document, it's a beautiful uh, graph, but most of the time it's filled, even in UK, when I was working there, it is, uh, it was filled retrospectively after the woman had delivered, it would be plotted, you know. Uh, and this is the same in Pakistan when it's plotted, beautiful graphs made after uh, everything's over. Uh, so the paperless partogram concept was that, uh, you know, you have an estimated time of delivery and actual time of delivery. So uh, uh, just like we have those action lines and so when a woman is say four centimeters, so 10 hours from that, uh, you know, you write in the chart that, okay, this is the time that uh, she should have delivered by then. And if it's not happening, and if she's not dilating one centimeter per hour, you should be thinking if you're in a second, not in a secondary care center, should be thinking about referral. So it's just getting the staff to think, you know, because uh, this is something they would do but not plot, plot the partogram. And I find that when we, uh, we are managing patients, we do a mental maths. Okay, so she's five centimeters or six centimeters now. She should be delivered by this and this time. And if it's not happening, then something's wrong. Uh, so I don't know. What do you think about that? No, as, you know, as um, doctors, midwives, nurses, and so on, it's... It's a difficult concept to capture, say, going retrospectively, because the idea of a uh, labor car guide or partogram is actually to prospectively identify that things are going to go wrong and therefore to action, take action early. So the original WHO paragraph was based on that principle and Philpot introduced that four hours to the right guideline to transfer cases who might be neglected and left in hospitals who might end up in the sarcovaginal fistulas and so forth. 
So they came to the hospital four hours after the right of the A, when they cut the action line and they got ARM and oxytocin. But if you're going to do retrospectively, you wouldn't know who is going to, who would have cut the line, who would not have cut the line and so on. Prospectively, it's easier to identify. So I think the concept is more difficult uh, without, and, and as uh, human beings working in different grades, a visual aid is usually more helpful. Yes. Rather than, yes. you know, because if I have, so I, I, when I do the ward drawings, I look at the notes, I look at everything, I look at the photograph, I look at, and after discussing with the staff, what, what is happening, what is going to happen, what might be the problems, then only I walk into the room to discuss with the woman and so on. So I think, uh, yeah. Uh, documentation is, uh, I think documentation helps a lot in medicine. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I'm not, uh, I, I, this is just something that, you know, I came across and in real life, uh, just pointing out that this is what happens in real life, that very few centers actually fill that photogram. But anyway, we must pledge that we will start doing it properly and we will do a randomized control trial in Pakistan, starting with all the lovely people we have here on this forum. And uh, Professor, Far I will request Professor Farooq to uh, conclude this meeting if he would, uh, his mic is mute though. So I don't know if he's there. One question about the latent phase, I would ask them to look at the lecture because the ACOG defines definitive periods for the latent phase. And the WHO lab, labor care guide does not provide a conclusive answer, but they want a definitive answer, then it's about 18 to 24 hours. But I think the basic principle is to support the women till they go into the active phase. Sorry, Farooq is on the mute, I think. Yeah, I think he's mute. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, taking time out, uh, Professor Arul Kumar and uh, uh, I'm sure we will get more questions uh, on the Facebook page. People often write that. And if we can answer it, uh, yes. Otherwise we may request you to answer those queries as well. And we will keep bothering you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for spending your afternoon or evening with me. Thank you. Evening. <laughs> it was lovely. We're honored. And thank you, Professor Rashid, Professor Razia Kurejo, Professor Lopna, uh, and uh, all the others, Dr. Azra, Dr. Lima, all those who joined us, thank you so much. Khuda Hafiz and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.